Ten years ago, if you were asked who were the most important Soviet composers, the obvious answer would have been Shostakovich and Prokofiev. Now, a lot of people are beginning to add a third name, Mieseslav Weinberg, whose dates are 1919 to 1996, and only since 1996, when he died, an event that was completely unnoticed in Europe and the United States, has his reputation begun to grow, and now suddenly he's much performed, much talked about, the great Latvian-born violinist Gidon Kramer has said that he's as great a composer as Shostakovich, which is a, an amazing accolade. Certainly one of the fascinations of Weinberg is his incredible life story. He was a Polish Jew, his father was a musician in the Yiddish theater, and his parents and sister were all victims of the Holocaust. <laughs> Weinberg himself escaped the Holocaust. He was rescued by the Red Army in Belorussia. He remembers mothers with children hugging the legs of the horses of the Russian soldiers begging to cross the border. And he was allowed to do so. Then, as the Germans continued to advance east, he moved further east to Tashkent, and it was in Tashkent that he met Shostakovich, and it was in Tashkent that he married. Shostakovich had encountered Weinberg's first symphony, which he admired, and this relationship became paramount 
for Weinberg, both personally and artistically. His wife was the daughter of the most famous Jewish actor in Russia, whose name was Solomon Mikhail. Then, in 1943, he moved to Moscow, which became his home. Five years later, Mikhail's was murdered by Stalin as ostensibly plotting with other Jews to overthrow the Soviet Union. And then in 1953, Stalin arrested Weinberg. A few months after his arrest, Stalin died, and Shostakovich intervened with Beria to have Weinberg released, and he was. So this incredible saga, you have to say, is composed into his music that like Shostakovich, he's an eyewitness to history, an eyewitness to the turmoil, the seizures, the seismic upheavals of Russian life in the 20th century and under Stalin. Rather incredibly, one understands that Weinberg was never a dissident. His gratitude to the Red Army for rescuing him was, was lifelong, as of course was his gratitude to Shostakovich. That's a, a relationship that plays out in so many ways. It's fascinating and incomprehensible, certainly Shostakovich's interest in Jewish music partly comes from Weinberg. Certainly, many elements of Weinberg's style come from Shostakovich. I'll read to you something that he wrote. He said, though many people think and have even written that I was a student of Shostakovich, I never was. But the Shostakovich School has been fundamental for my artistic work. Shostakovich helped me with many things, some of which I am not even aware of myself. It seems that he took steps to evoke sympathy towards my music. I considered myself to be a happy man because I could show my works to the finest composer of the 20th century. This was an honor that subconsciously, so it seems, activated my writing of music. I'm not aware that Shostakovich ever called himself a happy man. that we're hearing by Weinberg, the 24 Preludes for Solo Cello, is only a part of his remarkable output for cello. He wrote four solo cello sonatas, 24 Preludes for Solo Cello, two sonatas for cello and piano. Benjamin Capps has commented that the voice of the cello is a perfect medium for the music of Weinberg. Even though Weinberg was certainly not a cellist, he was a pianist.
So these preludes for cello, they actually comprise a cycle to hear the entire cycle complete, which takes 45, 50 minutes, is a draining experience, not least for the cellist. I don't know that there's a cheerful note in any of these 24 preludes. One of them quotes Shostakovich extensively. Another quotes the Schumann cello concerto. Certainly Weinberg is a composer aware of history but it's as a witness to history that perhaps he has its greatest impact. I'd like to quote something about Weinberg and other composers of his generation, written by Vladimir Feltzman, who knew Weinberg and who's a champion of Weinberg. Feltzman writes, in spite of the turmoil and brutality that characterized 20th century Russian history, or perhaps because of it, the artists who lived and worked in Russia during that time produced an amazing body of work. This legacy is precious, authentic, and meaningful. Russia was and still is a hard place, and the art that was created there is not easy. It was not meant to entertain or amuse but to turn our attention to the basic questions of life, to what is really important, and to ask hard questions that can only be answered by ourselves. You know, when Ben Capps performed these preludes here at the Washington National Cathedral, we had a little conversation with the audience afterwards, and a woman commented that he didn't seem very happy, he didn't seem to be enjoying himself, and Ben said, yes, it's grueling to play these 24 preludes, not least because they're not necessarily well written for the cello. Weinberg was not a cellist and yet composed prolifically for the cello because of the sound of the instrument and its expressive properties. He's not a composer for the cello who thinks of new ways to use the instrument. This is the kind of thing you associate with, say, Luciano Berrio, or with Benjamin Britten, who wrote solo suites for cello. There's none of that in Weinberg's solo cello music. It's not about the cello. The subject matter is whatever you care to make of it, but certainly the appeal of this music today has a great deal to do with the circumstances under which it was composed. Artistic life in the Soviet Union is a fascinating paradox. We think of it as 
oppressed, suppressed, and it was. But the exigencies were also productive in paradoxical ways. And composers like Shostakovich and Weinberg were able to feed off of the duress of being creative artists in the Soviet Union. Our experience of Weinberg here in DC, vis-a-vis -vis Post Classical Ensemble, is that there's a dimension of his music which is avant-garde, not something you find in Shostakovich. For instance, we did Weinberg's 10th Symphony, which connects to the European avant-garde in ways that Shostakovich does not. In the case of these 24 preludes for solo cello, they're not tonal. Shostakovich's music is tonal. I'm sure this is another ingredient in the fascination that, that Weinberg exerts. If you could simply see him in the context of Shostakovich, he would be less interesting. There was an initial impression of Weinberg in the West. I suppose that he was just a clone of Shostakovich. So we get to know him better and discover there are aspects of Weinberg you don't find in Shostakovich. To support himself, Weinberg wrote a lot of film music. In fact, the best known Soviet film of its time, I mean internationally the best known, The Cranes Are Flying from 1957, is scored by Weinberg. I'm quite sure that you won't find a screen credit for Weinberg on that film. But the music is very prominent. And you could say that we in the West were exposed to Weinberg's music without knowing it long before he began to acquire a great reputation as a concert composer. <laughs> 